If Siren Head were an SCP, which it isn't, but if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? For those rushing to the comments to correct me about Siren Head actually being an SCP, hear me out for a second. Siren Head was created by Trevor Henderson in 2018. From there, somebody made an SCP document about Siren Head titled SCP-6789. This document was never on the official SCP wiki. Instead, it was posted to one of our draft pages, known as a sandbox page. Eventually, the amount of people mistaking Siren Head for one of our creatures was to the point that SCP Wiki staff and Henderson together decided to delete that SCP-6789 draft page. You may also notice that SCP-5987 is titled Siren Head. What's the deal with that? Well, the author wrote a story about a ship's figurehead that could control other ships with a siren-like song. Figurehead that's also a siren? Siren Head, you see where this is going. The author named it Siren Head as a meme slash joke about the controversy of Siren Head being mistaken for an SCP. Funny? Yes. Confusing to a lot of people who just read the title and neglected to read the actual article? Also yes. The reason that this is such a big deal? The SCP Wiki only allows submission of original stories and creatures, and Trevor did not submit Siren Head to us, nor did he want Siren Head associated with the SCP Foundation. Also, legally speaking, SCP creations are subject to the Creative Commons license, which allows reuse with attribution. And if Trevor wanted to hold on to his creature's copyright, he definitely wouldn't want to release it to us. Alright, so with the history lesson out of the way, what would it be like if Siren Head were in the SCP universe? I see this as being very similar to SCP-1000, which is Bigfoot, a similar cryptid creature. The main containment procedures, regardless of any other factor, would be making sure that people who saw the entity would be amnesticized or discredited, or both. And news reports would be similarly taken down or painted as ridiculous. If there were multiple Siren Head entities, or if the singular entity is nomadic and uncontainable, that is the extent of our efforts. Now, Trevor has tweeted that Siren Head is a singular entity. So the question is, can we contain it? Siren Head stories don't often talk about Siren Head's durability, because no one is really trying to take it down. But we do know that it is organic except for the metal of its eponymous sirens. Some sort of powerful tranquilizer could be used to knock out the creature and transport it to a secure location where it couldn't break out. If the entity can't be tranked, and can't be held in a building, there is hope that we could isolate it so it didn't interact with people. If it stays in one specific area, the Foundation could create a perimeter, falsely registering it as a national park or saying there's environmental hazards or some such cover story, turn people away when they approach, and contain the Siren Head entity in its habitat. The Doomslayer is not an SCP, but if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? First, should the Doomslayer even be contained? Isn't it just a normal, non-anomalous human being? Well, the subject certainly started that way, but along its adventures, it has been blessed by the Seraphim and granted a cadre of anomalous abilities. Doom Guy doesn't need to eat or sleep, hasn't aged in decades of fighting demons. In combination with its Praetor Suit's boosts, the Doomslayer is stronger, faster, and more durable than any normal human being, and even many super soldiers. The entirety of Hell itself fears the Doomslayer, so containment is justified in our book. Wait, I hear you saying in the comments. The Doomslayer fights demons. Shouldn't we just let it be free to fight the good fight? Absolutely not. Remember, we are not here to save the world. The Foundation does not care if an anomaly is good or bad. The anomaly must be contained to preserve normalcy. Now, the easy way to contain it? The Hellions managed to lock the Doomslayer in a sarcophagus fueled by Argent Energy for a long time. Our Foundation Thaumaturgy Specialist should have no problem recreating the containment method due to our reliable source of hellish intelligence, SCP-4357-J. The Cooperative Demon, as we call it, consistently and accidentally feeds us intelligence on how to better contain demon-related entities. It is not out of the realm of possibility that we could use this intelligence to contain the Doomslayer. However, locking Doom Guy in stasis doesn't make for an interesting story, does it? A far more interesting situation would be mirroring the story of another sarcophagus-bound, bloodlusting warrior we have in containment, SCP-076, codename Abel. Like Abel, Doom Guy could prove very useful if assigned to a mobile task force to contain anomalies. Of course, all would not be well in paradise. 
The Doomslayer has a one-track mind for slaying demons, and the Foundation policy is to contain anomalies, not destroy them. There would be a point where the Doomslayer would become frustrated with allowing the anomalies to live, at which point it would likely defect to the Global Occult Coalition. The GOC, as we call them, are a rival faction, or group of interest, to the Foundation. Under the direction of the United Nations, they also strive to hide anomalies from the general public. They differ from the Foundation in that their core principle is to destroy all anomalies that are not beneficial and controllable to their cause. While the Doomslayer is rather difficult to control, its goal to annihilate demon kind would fit well with the GOC's ethos. The imposters from among us aren't SCPs, but if they were, how would the SCP Foundation contain them? A special shout out to Cyan in the Site42 YouTube Super Chat for these priority con procs, and also to TikToker at the Top 7 Man for assisting in research. As you can imagine, the Foundation is no stranger to shapeshifting entities. The imposters would have a dedicated site for containment due to the possibility of staff duplication. There is debate among high-level staff as to whether the on-site nuclear warheads should be set on the lowest level activation protocol for ease of use in case of containment breach, or the highest due to the nature of the imposters in that their goal is to kill all present humans and the warhead would be a very simple way to do so. They'll solve that someday. Containment cells would be equipped with low-tech pressurized doors similar to those found on submarines. This would prevent the entities from working through the space between the door and its frame, either in case of sabotage or in case they can take other forms. Obviously, their cells would not have vents. Based on their spiked tongues and razor-sharp teeth, the logical leap that they have a different physiology from mankind isn't a stretch. Over time, a reliable, portable scanner would be devised, either technologically or thaumaturgically. Until then, body scans would be necessary for personnel at the end of each shift or when exiting the site. We wouldn't want to have another Dr. Kaufman situation on our hands. Bill Cipher isn't an SCP, but if it was, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Ah, I love having options. We have got five, count them, five different containment procedures for our favorite one-eyed monster. <clears throat> what do you mean it's not your favorite one-eyed monster? Oh, shut up. Ketter duty, one week. God. Okay, so first, the Zodiac containment spell. It's a classic. It didn't work in the show because of sibling rivalry, but with proper persuasion, we can knock this one out by the books. In scenario two, Bill Cipher is lured to a location, and the thaumaturgical spell used by the Pines family to protect the Mystery Shack, the one including unicorn hair as a component, is used to seal Billy Boy into a single location. We build our remote containment site around that. Now, say we can't get access to unicorn hair for some reason, like Marshall, Carter, and Dark decided not to share theirs this time. The lousy jerks. In that case, we can still evacuate the town of Gravity Falls, Oregon, and leave Bill with all his weird Mageddon, well, weirdness, locked inside the protective barrier of Gravity Falls. Town-wide isolation is better than nothing. But okay, I know what you're really here for. No unicorn hair, the town barrier nullified, what do we do if a free Bill Cipher is ready to tear up everything? The same way they did it in the show, mostly. See. Our foundation is knowledgeable about multiple realities, different dimensions, and all manner of things outside the bounds of our perception. Bill is always looking for the next big place to party. So I say, we give it to him. Send Dr. Bright out there with a promise of some sort of enticing knowledge. Convince Bill into Bright's mind, and immediately put Dr. Bright into a coma. Remove the amulet and place it on another D-Class to bring Bright back, and put the old comatose body into a stasis cell. Presto, freeze-dried Bill Cipher. And of course, while we do not like destroying anomalies, we do what we have to do to maintain normalcy. So if none of the above plans worked, it is time for Ford's quantum destabilizer, held by someone who won't miss. <laughs> Homelander is not an SCP, but if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Spoiler warning for the comics and TV adaptation of The Boys. Oh boy. Containing Superman, but trading out the easily exploitable kryptonite weaknesses for narcissistic sociopathy. How fun. 
If we were working with a TV continuity, we could use our artificial intelligence constructs to troll the web in order to obtain the multitude of damning videos of Homelander's repugnant actions and threaten to release those to the public. Assuming anomalies and magic work the same way they do on Superman in most canons, we could also leverage the subjects caring about its child, Ryan Butcher, to affect compliance as Vought Enterprises did. Lock the child in the room next door to SCP-956, codename The Child Breaker, and call it a day. In fact, let's cover our bases and do both. Of course, in the comics, we don't have a child to blackmail with, and narcissism only bends so far before we start losing containment sites. We should certainly start considering decommissioning options. Hey, let's toss my amulet on him. Do you know how fast that heat vision could cook my burritos? Absolutely fucking not, Bright. The last time we gave you a body that had the power of flight, we had to pay for the dry cleaning bills of the entire neighborhood of <laughs> Ugh. The decommissioning department has been racking its collective brains trying to figure out how to neutralize Homelander. And it seems they reached out for a bit of help. Damn right, nerd. We here at the Global Occult Coalition know that the right thing to do with any supernatural threat is to neutralize it. We only keep that garbage around if it is 100% controllable and useful to us, or we can't just destroy it. Homelander is a particularly powerful suit, and in the comics, he was only defeated by a clone of himself. And that clone was only taken down by conventional weaponry because it was weakened from the previous battle. I am not at liberty to say what sort of arsenal we have at our disposal in front of our super cuddly panty waist friend over here. But I'll just say that if I have to grab one of the Scarlet King himself's spears to take down this red, white, and blue bastard, I will do it in a heartbeat. <sighs> Buffoons. The Muppets aren't SCPs, but if they were, how would the SCP Foundation contain them? Walking, talking, puppet-like entities? These definitely seem like something we ought to contain, along with our menagerie of living stuffed animals. Most of the Muppets, like Scooter, Sam the Eagle, Rolf, and the rest, are easy enough to contain in basic humanoid containment chambers, object class Euclid. However, we should have particularly reinforced rooms for Sweetums, who habitually runs through walls, Crazy Harry, who always seems to have another explosive on its person, and Gonzo, due to whatever maddeningly chaotic thing it does next. Some researchers would suggest that Dr. Bunsen Honeydew and its assistant Beaker may seem well suited to working at the Foundation, or at least given privileges to perform experiments to help us further technologically. Those researchers are fools. If you've seen the multitude of ways those two's inventions could be detrimental to containment staff, you'd change your mind in a snap. The security contingent assigned to Miss Piggy is to be staffed with twice as many guards as usual, and those particular guards must have scored highly on their close quarters combat courses, for reasons I think are obvious. Animals to be kept in a state of permanent tranquilization after the Kappa 7 incident. And their leader, Kermit the Frog, kept in a completely different sight from the rest of them. I will not have any rousing speeches leading to a containment bre- Report! What do you mean you didn't give a large enough dose? Get me Delta- The Jedi are not SCPs, but if they were, how would the SCP Foundation contain them? The Jedi, the Sith, and all other types of Force users have a vast array of anomalous abilities at their disposal. Increased strength, speed, and stamina, able to leap incredible heights, telekinesis, tossing lightning around, mental influence, and that's not even an exhaustive list. Raw power-wise, we have seen Force users rip Star Destroyers out of the sky. So how would the SCP Foundation contain such entities? Our simplest solution would be to obtain some Isalomars. These creatures nullify Force sensitivity within their perimeter due to being hunted by creatures who use the Force to hunt them. With a stacking effect, the more of them you have around. A prison stock with Isalomar would be a very effective containment. Except okay, Let's say our Foundation spacecraft aren't capable of reaching the planet Merkur. What else could prove effective? The Containment Field. Used in Episode 2 in the Clone Wars animated series, a simple combination of electricity, magnets, and a bioscanner allow us to interrupt a Force user's concentration, taking away their ability to focus and use their Force abilities. Of course, some might assert that the Sith might use that pain to fuel their power. I mean, they contain Count Dooku using this, but okay, let's just say it doesn't work. Carbonite. A frozen Force user is cut off from the Force during hibernation. Freeze, dried, 
force user, problem solved, and what more? As a last resort, we could remove their ability to manipulate the force at all and decommission them in the process using the Bardotten Sphere. Also known as the Living Sphere, this artifact drains the living force from an entity. It can only be activated by a force-sensitive individual, but in a universe where the force exists, it's not a stretch to imagine one of our researchers or agents are a practitioner of the force that we can use for this purpose. It also acts as a battery that can be used to power advanced rituals, meaning that as a bonus, we could utilize said force energy to another use, such as uh, containing or neutralizing the Scarlet King. Who knows? Superman is not an SCP, but if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Superman is as strong as the plot needs it to be. Essentially infinitely strong and fast, flight and heat vision and ice breath and yada yada yada. Thank the long fish that the comic gods decided to hamstring this boy scout with the most ubiquitous weakness next to the Achilles heel, say it with me now, pretty reporters. Oh, and uh, kryptonite. Like a humanoid solar panel, Mr. Kent gets its power from the yellow sun so a properly shielded bunker deep underground would be more than suitable to deprive soups of its energy source. From there, a properly prepared chamber lined up with kryptonite generously provided by LexCorp would be waiting for our newest resident. Why would Superman fly directly into such a trap? Because of the pretty reporter I mentioned earlier. If I had a nickel for every time I kidnapped an anomalous person's loved one to lead them into a trap, I would have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Slenderman is not an SCP, but if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Slenderman is attributed a wide array of abilities, depending on different interpretations of the entity. Some consistent powers are invisibility, teleportation, the ability to turn humans into its proxies, and infecting its prey with what has been dubbed Slender Sickness, a combination of memory loss, paranoia, sleepwalking, nausea, and nosebleeds. There is also the associated phenomenon that it seems to prey on individuals who have knowledge of it. The more you learn about the entity, the more it wishes to attack you. This led to our first, albeit unsuccessful, attempt at containing Slenderman using disinformation. In the early days of the entity's spread, Foundation web crawlers rapidly took down swaths of websites mentioning Slenderman in hopes of keeping the public from attracting its attention. Not only did this fail due to the viral spread of Slenderman intelligence, but several Foundation researchers on the project also inadvertently became victims of the entity themselves. All work on Slenderman past this point was transferred to the Department of Miscommunications, experts at dealing with anomalies that attack you for knowing of them. The final containment protocols were enacted on August 10th, 2018. The entity was lured into a containment chamber using a D-Class, at which point the SRAs were activated. Oh, what is an SRA? The Scranton Reality Anchor is a wonderful piece of paratech concocted by our top Foundation researchers. To summarize Dr. James Caldman and Carlos Rizuski's report, Reality can be measured in a unit we call Humes. Baseline reality measures at one Hume, and it is possible for certain places or entities to be more or less real than the baseline. Entities with lower Hume counts than their surroundings tend to be pushed around by the waves of reality, while entities with higher Hume levels than their surroundings are the ones doing the pushing. Using the Scranton Reality Anchor, we can siphon reality from a different universe and bring it to a specific location to balance the humes with the entity, negating the entity's ability to push reality around. Coming back to our dear dapper Slendy, with the trap sprung, reality around the entity balanced, leaving a tall, sad, faceless man pounding at the walls of its prison with hands and a few errant tentacles. Five Nights at Freddy's is not an SCP, but if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Due to the extensive lore of the franchise, we will be focusing on the first game for today, and save the rest of the games, the books, the future film, etc. for later installments. Upon hearing about the anomalous animatronics, the Foundation would purchase Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. After shutting it down under the guise of a health code violation, a provisional site would be set up around the restaurant. During the day shift, researchers would run experiments on the animatronics, diagnostics on their programming, assembling and disassembling the endoskeletons. Perhaps with some luck, our researchers would successfully discover Remnant far sooner than it was revealed in the lore. At night, we are faced with two possibilities. If the animatronics are happy to simply stay in the restaurant at night when it is empty, success! 
No more containment procedures necessary. However, I'd wager that there's a reason in the original game that there had to be a night guard, such as the animatronics attempting to leave if nobody was in the restaurant. If that's the case, the role of night guard would be filled with a D-Class, one with a history of child abuse if the animatronics are particularly picky. If the D-Class is adept enough to survive the night, good for them. If not, we've always got more disposable, <laughs> I mean, D-Class personnel. And what about Golden Freddy? If it's content to stay in the restaurant as the other animatronics are, I don't see any issue. But if it decides to get feisty and attempts to strike out on its own, well, let's just say that we've got teams that can bust ghosts with the best of them. The game theorists are not SCPs, but if they were, how would the SCP Foundation contain them? The theorist community acts as a sort of hive mind, although primary direction of the anomaly comes from the self-proclaimed 900 IQ big brain known as Matthew Patrick, or MatPat for short. The entity holds numerous anomalous abilities, the primary of which is cognitohazardous in nature. The entity is capable of reaching into the minds of victims and twisting their memories of beloved childhood media, often in horrifying ways. This is colloquially known as ruining your childhood. The entity also claims to have the ability to predict or theorize the future of currently running franchises. However, due to its poor track record of successful predictions, this dubious claim still requires testing. So, how do we contain this anomaly? Our first instinct was to silence the initial Game Theorist channel using similar special containment procedures to SCP-3949. Members of Mobile Task Force Omicron 5, codename True Fans, would flood the comments section of Game Theory videos with insults regarding the quality of editing, leaps in logic, and other weak points. Unfortunately, the shameless nature of the MatPat entity resulted in even our strongest rebuke, repeated use of the term cringe, failing to cause it to leave the YouTube platform as intended. By the time we realized the process wouldn't work, spin-off theorist channels had emerged. Beyond that, public knowledge of the anomaly had reached the point where full containment was no longer possible. A small victory, though. Agents embedded within YouTube's corporate structure were able to feed theorist channels through a cognito filter that inhibits their ability to absorb more victims into the hive mind. Disinformation campaigns are continually running to make sure the general public sees the theorist community as just another YouTube channel. Addendum. Several predictive anomalies report that the fourth slice of the theorist circle is going to be filled in, and that the final slice will be data expunged by order of the O5 Council. Nick Nocturne is not an SCP. But if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Nick Nocturne is the designation for the Keter class demon human hybrid that runs the YouTube channel Nightmind. Nick's demonic capabilities are in line with Foundation understanding. Shapeshifting, greater than human strength at human size, creation and manipulation of hellfire, spirit manipulation, etc. The entity's weaknesses are also well documented, subject to influence of those who know its true name, as well as various sigils and wards of the Abrahamic faiths. Unfortunately for our containment specialists, we have yet to discover the true name of this entity, and as a child of the first demon, Lilith, the power of the necessary wards is currently beyond Foundation knowledge. Even SCP-4357-J, our best source of advanced demonic containment procedures, is unwilling to talk about wards at that level. Due to our inability to successfully contain Nick, the next step in maintaining normalcy would be destruction of the entity. While within our capabilities, doing so would cause a level of collateral damage and civilian loss of life equivalent to a medium-sized city. Not that we wouldn't disappear an entire city, consider the case of Stockton, South Carolina. But we like to avoid that whenever possible. Luckily, Nick is also half-human, and has taken a liking to living a mostly human lifestyle. This allowed the Foundation to work out a truce with the Entity. Nick maintains public-facing normalcy, and in return, the Foundation doesn't have to resort to extreme measures. On top of that, there is the added benefit that the Nightmind YouTube channel does lend a hand in research of anomalies from time to time. That's a gift horse whose hundreds of demonic mouths I am not looking at. Wanda Maximoff, otherwise known as the Scarlet Witch, is not an SCP. But if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Hello, I'm Dr. Theron Sherman, and in this series we construct hypothetical containment procedures for non-SCP popular culture entities and objects. Let's begin. Looking at the comics as well as the WandaVision show, we see that Wanda is capable of massive feats of magic. Based on what we've compiled, we feel comfortable classifying her as what we call a reality bender. 
Reality benders can be some of the most dangerous types of anomalies. When you can reshape your reality to your whims, it's often very hard to justify not doing so, especially when most adversaries can simply be poofed out of existence. Thankfully, there are some tricks up our sleeve for handling this situation. The Scranton Reality Anchor is our favorite get out of jail free card for reality benders. These babies adjust the humes of an area to match the entity, causing them to be unable to reshape that area. It could be as simple as putting two or three of them around the containment cell, or if we wanted some comic book level drama, we could construct a spherical containment chamber lined with SRAs as a melodramatic prison worthy of a multiverse scale villain. Of course, there are also other tactics available to us. One of those would be to contain Maximoff near a reality sink. Reality sinks are essentially the opposite of reality benders. They act as a black hole for anomalous energies, depowering nearby anomalies simply by existing. As mentioned in SCP-5004, there are multiple reality sinks known to the Foundation, such as former President Donald Trump, as well as our own Dr. Clef. Of course, there is always a likelihood that we are in far, far over our heads here. Other reality-bending entities we've attempted to contain are SCP-343, who stays in his cell willingly because we are, quote, interesting. SCP-239, an eight-year-old girl who may have created Santa Claus and whom Dr. Clef has proposed plans to terminate. SCP-3999, who was decommissioned through sheer willpower by researcher James Talleran only after the entity had put Talleran through several millennia of ever-changing tortures. And SCP-3812, a man named Sam Howell, who died, came back to life, worked with the Foundation to control his powers, started displaying schizophrenia-like symptoms while wielding his powers in more and more erratic ways, and after numerous failed containment and neutralization attempts, seemingly ascended to a higher plane or something of a similar nature. Before you comment, this thing happening with my hair is due to an interaction with SCP and, you know, I'm starting to dig it. But anyways, let's get down to business. Alistair the Radio Demon is not an SCP, but if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Hello, I'm Dr. Theron Sherman, and in this series we construct hypothetical containment procedures for non-SCP popular culture entities and objects. Let's begin. As the show is only in pilot, we have very little information to work with at present, but you has been hotel fans have been highly aggressive about getting your boy on the show, as well as documenting every shred of information you can find hidden in the initial episode. I'm honestly impressed. You're all going to make fine researchers once you're out of Academy. Alistair is a demon, specifically one of the more powerful overlords of hell. A lot of the show seems to be alluding to Jewish or Christian religious tropes, such as mentions of Lucifer, Lilith, angels, etc. So much like our Nick Nocturne episode, we'll be digging into demonic containment procedures today. The quickest and cheapest method of demonic containment is the trusty salt circle. Depending on what lore you're following, it could be as easy as pouring a circle of salt, or as difficult as using thaumaturgy to power the containment spell and entering a battle of wills with your captive. And either way, this simple spell is a pushover for more powerful entities. We probably need something with a little more punch. Thankfully, we have a man, or demon, on the inside. SCP-4357-J, nicknamed the Cooperative Demon, is a demon who, in the course of berating our researchers with how stupid they must be to be unable to contain it properly, has repeatedly spilled tips that make its containment more secure, up to the point of painting on security glyphs itself, and even building its own wrought iron cage. These stronger fortifications, along with religious iconography and spray bottles of holy water, have reliably kept 4357-J in containment, and prove invaluable to daily containment of Abrahamic faith-based entities. Of course, like Nick Nocturne, we're looking at one of the highest echelons of demon here, so let's break down the anomalous abilities we need to contain. Pyrokinesis? SCP-457 is a being of sentient flame, so sprinkler systems will be a requirement. Shadow Manipulation? If your entity can manipulate shadows, leave no shadows to manipulate. SCP-017 is a blueprint for shadowless room containment protocols. Much of Alistair's demonic or voodoo magics can be nullified by the right combination of runes and sigils. Unfortunately, the Foundation's biggest weakness is teleportation. After all, SCP-507, the reluctant dimension hopper, still ports out of containment at random, and all we can do is go pick it up when it reappears. Since Alistair is capable of teleporting himself as well as others by using portals, all we can hope is that some combination of religious iconography, the iron in the containment cell, and liberal application of Scranton reality anchors can do the job. 
If so, brilliant, we nailed it. If not, well, I guess we just have to hope that that snazzy demon stays down in hell. The TVA is not an SCP, but if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Hello, I'm Dr. Theron Sherman, and in this series we construct hypothetical containment procedures for non-SCP popular culture entities and objects. Before we begin, today's episode is brought to you by the Site42 Patreon. Head to the link in our bio to get early access to Site42 videos and other perks. And as always, support independent artists. Now, let's get started. Spoilers for all of Season 1 of Loki. The Time Variance Authority is the kind of bureaucratic, authoritarian shadow organization that the Foundation can really get along with. There are probably multiple realities where the TVA and SCP Foundation simply work together. But in case things don't go smooth, and let's face it, it never goes smooth, let's look at other ways the Foundation has dealt with, essentially, itself. In SCP-4755, the Foundation, 100 years from now, has become so evolved that it has ascended to a non-conceptual form of existence and is literally containing its past self, us. In SCP-4839, the Administrator from one of the alternate realities becomes so obsessed with containing things that they attempt to contain literally everything. SCP-1322 is a wild ride where we find a wormhole to an alternate dimension with an alternate foundation, but while things go well in the beginning trading technology and things like that, one of our harmless flu viruses decimates their global population, and the vaccine we send them to cure it sterilizes the rest of them. So they start sending nuclear weapons through the wormhole for revenge. And in my personal favorite example, SCP-4052 is the story of the time the Foundation went head-to-head -head with, I kid you not, the Sandwich Police, or as they call themselves, Sandwich Cataclysm Prevention. If you bring anything resembling a sandwich into the city of Sandwich, Illinois, an extra-dimensional officer will materialize, ask to see your sandwich license, and since who has one of those, he takes your sandwich to his sandwich police car and disappears. Apparently, sandwiches somehow cause cataclysms in their dimension, and we eventually reach an agreement with them to stop testing and blowing up their home. With sandwiches. So, with all of this research, how would we contain the TVA? It's actually very simple, and would progress almost identically to the plot of the Loki series. First, we need to encounter the TVA. That's easy. The Foundation is probably responsible for a fairly high amount of branching timelines on their own. Once we've encountered a group of TVA hunters, the question is, can we stop them from purging our timeline long enough to procure one of their temp pads? And since they seemingly only come armed with their purging sticks and the purge grenade, I believe our mobile task forces, or even one agent armed with a gun, would do fine enough at this step. Once we've engaged the TVA, we covertly research their archives to discover the void at the end of time. After pruning several D-Class and tracking them using chronometers to make sure it works, we'd send our agents into the void. Here, we have Eliath. A daunting threat to be sure, but if two Loki variants are enough to enchant the entity, so too can any multitude of memetics or cognitohazards we have lying around. Hell, maybe we'll just toss the procrastination rock into it, and it will put off eating us and open the way to our final destination, the Citadel at the end of time. And when we face Immortus or Kang or whatever he's calling himself, what does the Foundation do from there? Obviously, we take his deal, take over the TVA, and run the show ourselves. Hey, look at me. Look at me. I'm the TVA now. Also, just an extra thought. If you change the names around with the Loki plot a little, there is a Prime Foundation who's maintaining normalcy and protecting their universe from being ZK'd by ZKing every branch in the timeline and alternate foundation is a solid 001 proposal. I wouldn't be shocked if we already have an article or tale like that and I simply don't know about it. The Death Note is not an SCP. But if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Hello, I'm Dr. Theron Sherman. And in this series, we construct hypothetical containment procedures for non-SCP, popular culture, entities, and objects. Let's begin. Almost all Death Notes currently in the human world are kept within a safe class containment locker located at Site <laughs> while the few that are still on the loose are being tracked by our field agents. The first Death Note the Foundation acquired was put through rigorous testing. Dr. <laughs> who scored high in loyalty to the Foundation and low to medium in empathy, ran numerous tests on the abilities of the Death Note. Several D-Class later, the capabilities and limitations of the object were well understood. 
Further intelligence was gained through interviews with the Shinigami entity, including information about the Shinigami realm and the existence of other Death Notes and Shinigami. In order to contain the other Death Notes, Foundation artificial intelligence constructs use algorithmic abnormalities and causes of death data to predict with 95.8% accuracy that a Death Note is in play, based on the progression of the testing its capabilities that all new owners go through. If you think that's a little far-fetched, remember that civilian algorithms used by the store chain known as Target were able to determine that a teen girl was pregnant before her father knew. Google Target knows you're pregnant. It's a trip. It's incredible how fast civilians are catching up with Foundation tech. For those concerned for the safety of our requisition teams chasing down the Death Notes, have no fear. When you're part of a global secret organization that erases the memories of everyone who encounters us, we're not worried about you finding our name and face before we find you. Bendy and the Ink Machine is not an SCP. But if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Hello, I'm Dr. Theron Sherman, and in this series we construct hypothetical containment procedures for non-SCP popular culture entities and objects. Let's begin. In order to go through with this hypothetical, we need to assume that the story of Bendy and the Ink Machine actually happened. No dream sequences, and no, we're actually in purgatory or hell here. The defunct Joey Drew Studios office would be purchased by the Foundation. As we can't up and move an entire building, a containment site would be set up with a cover story of condemning the building. Gawking civilians and adventurous youths alike would be turned away by on-site security and or amnesticized as needed. Within the opening rooms of the building, a foothold would be set up by researchers and security forces. Security teams would room by room explore the facility and mop up the ink creatures. Likely a thrilling scene for a Mobile Task Force themed short film, don't you think? Wink at the camera. Our biggest goal would be the ink machine itself. I can tell you from personal experience that Foundation researchers would be chomping at the bit to analyze anomalous tech like that. Finding a way to power off and piece by piece remove the machine from the office and bring it to our labs would be our number one research priority. And in the worst case scenario, the ink creatures, even the ridiculously powerful Bendy itself, never seem to attempt to leave the studio. So even if we can't procure the equipment for research, it's still a successful containment if we can lock down the office and keep the ink creatures from escaping. Firebenders are not SCPs. But if they were, how would the SCP Foundation contain them? Hello, I'm Dr. Theron Sherman, and in this series we construct hypothetical containment procedures for non-SCP popular culture entities and objects. Let's begin. Today's episode is brought to you by the Site42 Patreon. Head to the link in our bio to get early access to Site42 videos and other perks. As always, support independent artists. Firebending is a unique form of bending in the Avatar world. While earth, water, and airbenders require their element to be present to be bent, firebenders are capable of generating fire, lightning, and explosive blasts from nothing but their own breath. This makes them a unique containment challenge, but nothing we can't handle. Luckily for our research, the Legend of Korra showed us a high security prison specifically meant to contain Red Lotus member Plea. To start, an Antarctic site would be established, as cold temperatures and distance from the equator both dampen firebending efficacy. A layer of ice would be utilized in the containment cell, as well as industrial air conditioning equipment. Many will wonder about the breath of fire technique that Zuko and Iroh have utilized in cold temperatures to maintain body heat. While true that it is a wonderful survival tool to stop oneself from freezing to death, the ability isn't meant to sustain firebending power levels in extreme conditions. To dissuade any lightning-based escape attempts, firebenders capable of the lightning bending technique would be placed in a separate wing reinforced with insulation. Ice is a poor conductor of electricity already, but we can't be too careful. Those capable of the combustion bending style, epitomized by plea and fan favorite Sparky Sparky Boom Boom Man, would be fitted with metal helmets covering their third eye. Even powerless, firebending culture has strong focus on martial arts acumen. To deal with this, all on-site security staff would be required to hold high marks in close quarters combat, as well as carry standard issue equipment to prevent any altercations. Deadpool is not an SCP. But if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Hello, I'm Dr. Theron Sherman, and in this series we construct hypothetical containment procedures for non-SCP popular culture entities and objects. Let's begin. Ah, Deadpool. The Merc with the Mouth. The regenerating degenerate. That asshole. Deadpool has quite the arsenal of powers, skills, weapons, and gadgets. 
Powers-wise, we're looking at regeneration, enhanced strength, enhanced speed, resistance to psychic assault and some toxins, and of course, fourth wall awareness. For skills, the mercenary boasts knowledge of multiple martial arts, enhanced athletic prowess, and is an expert marksman and swordsman. The subject is always armed with its signature weapons, swords, guns, knives, and grenades. It also uses gadgets such as holographic projectors and a variety of teleportation devices. The first step in standard containment would be an overdose of tranquilizers to sedate the subject, possibly hidden in a chimichanga. This will give our agents ample opportunity to disarm and bind the subject Hannibal Lecter style. Can't have any of those fancy martial arts being used on our researchers, can we? Our focus of study would be Deadpool's healing factor, using a combination of the mutant inhibitor collar featured in Deadpool 2, along with different healing-centric SCPs, we could learn much from our new guinea pig without accidentally letting its cancer cause it to shuffle off its mortal coil to its waiting girlfriend's arms. One last thorn in our side we need to worry about is Deadpool's quote, insanity, that allows it to realize that it is a fictional character. Well, I should say, Thorn that we don't need to worry about at all, because Deadpool isn't the only one who can play the fourth wall breaking game. In one of the many SCP-001 proposals, specifically S. Andrew Swan's proposal, the Foundation collates the data from all SCP documents into a single extra-universal server that realizes that articles are being added, updated, and deleted with no rhyme nor reason. Or, no rhyme nor reason until they realize the truth. They are fictional characters in a universe created by SCP-001. Us, the SCP authors. Bwah! Beyond that, we have the Pataphysics Department, which is a fictional department created by the Foundation for the containment of metafictional entities. So, the fictional Foundation created a fictional department, and that fictional department deconstructed an intrafictional character into a depressed shell of its author using an unfinished version of its character manuscript that they straight up made up in order to contain it, and now I've gone cross-eyed from confusion. Ugh. Sure, it nearly figured out the game and got away, and also nearly deconstructed the pataphysics department itself in the process, but you know what? Deadpool's best fourth wall breaks are information gathering, not bending the universe around its will. So we're gonna be fine, I hope. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 is not an SCP. But if it were, how would the SCP Foundation contain it? Hello, I'm Dr. Theron Sherman, and in this series we construct hypothetical containment procedures for non-SCP popular culture entities and objects. Today's episode is brought to you by the Site42 merch store. Head to the link in our bio to get SCP merch commissioned from SCP artists. As always, support independent artists. With that out of the way, let's begin. As a reminder, Five Nights at Freddy's is an expansive lore, so our containment hypotheticals will focus on one game at a time. As with the original Freddy Fazbear's Pizza location, the Foundation would first purchase the location and animatronics and close the facility, or use agents embedded in local government to condemn the restaurant for obvious health code violations. Our staff would need the means to survive working in the facility. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 definitely took the bigger is better approach to the FNAF franchise. We've got 11 animatronics plus multiple ghost-like entities. There are more rooms, more cameras, more entries into the office, and not even the decency of doors to keep you safe. But really, who needs doors when you have the Freddy Fazbear mask? This baby keeps you safe from 90% of the game's animatronics by fooling their sensors into thinking you are one of them. As a start, research staff would be provided customized hazmat suits modeled to look like the animatronic mascots during on-site study. Proper oxygenation would ensure that no low oxygen hallucinations cause any issues. Note that the Foundation already has experience in modified fursuits, shown in the field log, Mobile Task Furries. These custom suits don't protect from all the animatronics, however. We still have to contend with Foxy and Marionette, both of which are wildly simple fixes. For the Marionette, an automated winder would be installed to keep its music box from reaching the end. Meanwhile, Foxy is stopped by a blinking flashlight, so strobe lights would be installed in its home zone to keep it pinned down. With our researchers safe to study the interior of the restaurant day or night, we don't even need to waste D-class personnel keeping the animatronics busy. Well, we won't after the trial and error nights of figuring out the containment protocols, that is. And of course, a Scranton reality anchor would be installed on site to mitigate the danger of any pesky wandering shades. The Doki Doki Literature Club is not an SCP, but if it were, 
How would the SCP Foundation contain it? Sentient artificial intelligence constructs would be worthy of containment in the Foundation's eyes. Luckily, the containment is quite simple. In our scenario, the game would be removed from download platforms as soon as the Foundation got word that the characters were alive. A disinformation campaign would be enacted to convince the general public that the game was never released, simply an urban legend. You may recall a similar containment procedure we enacted called Polybius. Foundation web crawlers would remove conspiratorial posts that refute our story, and agents would be dispatched to amnesticize particularly adamant gamers. Team Salvato, the developers of the game, would be detained and questioned. Their containment, amnestization, or other fates would be up to the answers they gave regarding their creation of these AIs. Two copies of the game would be kept intact, the testing copy and the backup copy. The testing copy would be stored on a Foundation computer without internet access. This computer would be kept in a Faraday-shielded room. Researchers are to relinquish all electronics before entering the chamber. The backup copy would be kept in an isolated data drive in a storage locker. Researchers would begin study by interviewing the Monica Entity. In kinder research scenarios, we would continue working with the Monica Entity and possibly give it a non-staff therapist to help it deal with its emotional issues regarding its situation. In colder test scenarios, we would likely have Monica deleted in order to pass the self-awareness onto the other characters in order to gain even more insight. As for the cryptic references regarding Project Libertina, the Portrait of Markov, the Third Eye, etc. Well, research continues. Make sure to like and share this video, comment any creatures you would like to see containment procedures implemented for, and remember that patrons of Site42 get priority for their Conprox requests. Secure. Contain. Protect. <laughs>